Good afternoon. Thank you for attending today's special board meeting. Time is 5.40. We'll call to order and Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll move on to new business. 3A, discussion and possible action to select law firm to provide legal services through the RFQ process to include interviews and Q&A by Board of Trustees. Yes, sir. Um, President Guerra, Dr. Spinoza, members of the board, uh, we're here for your consideration with respect to an RFQ concerning legal services. Currently, our legal services contract is set to expire September 1st the volume I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Or All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, we're here thank to, you. thank you very much. Uh, we're here to ask for your consideration to select for legal services. Currently, our legal services contract is set to expire September the 1st, 2017. Just a little background information. Uh, the Socorro Independent School District issued a request for qualifications for legal services. That solicitation was posted on July the 19th and the 26th. And at that time, all vendors were notified that based on the initial rankings, the district would select the top ranked qualifi qualifiers and ask that they conduct board presentations between the, the week of August the 7th through the 9th. The qualifications were received on Tuesday, August the 2nd. We received 10 solicitations, three from local companies, seven from out-of-town firms. A core committee was met, met on Friday, August the 4th to review the, the listings and to rank the finalists. The committee consisted of Ramon Aguilar, uh, Tom Ayington, myself, Maribel Macias, and Mr. Joe San Miguel. The board recommended the following firms, Blanco, Ordanes, Mata, and Wallace, J. Cruz and Associates, Mount Screen, Myers, Safi, Paxton, and Gall, Scott, Scott Holtz, and Thompson and Horton. Since that selection, two firms have withdrawn. That's J. Cruz and Thompson and Horton. This is for a contract period of a two-year contract with an option to extend for three additional one-year options for a total of five years. Our goal here is to have the firms come in, give you a 10-minute presentation. Ms. Darío will keep track of the time, and there'll be five minutes for a Q&A. At that point, we'll ask them to leave, and then we'll call in the other firms. If you'd like, we can ask them to wait in case you have any follow-up questions after the three firms provide their presentations, or we can let them take off. It's up to you. We're following last time, the procedures we did last time, which was discussion is an open forum. Um, any discussions among yourselves, just keep that in mind and we'll go from there. Are there any questions with respect to the process that we're gonna have here? Mr. Lessa, you said two years and? And then three additional one year options for a total of five years. Are the three additional years done right away? Is it one year? It, it, it's one year right after the other. Unless there's a request or consideration from the board as a whole, usually administration automatically renews the contract. Mr. Gonzalez? When would they be informed as to who won the contract? We, we ask them, we, we give them within a week's period of time, because you'll make a recommendation, and at that point, we'll notify the top qualifier, and then we'll negotiate a contract with them, and then from there, uh, if everything's set, then we'll, we'll let everybody know. But we, we're telling them that within a week's time, we'll notify them. Our, our goal is to notify them as quickly as possible and then make sure that the contract is, is established and, and approved. Okay. So uh, without any further ado, we'll go ahead. And first, it'll be Blanco and Ordonez Mata. Number two will be Mounts Green Myers, and then it'll be Scott Holtz. Okay. So we'll start. We'll bring them in. And again, 10 minutes and then five minutes Q&A. Thank you.
feel like I'm far away. Do you want me to go ahead and start? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Board President Guetta, Dr. Espinosa, members of the board. I see we have a few missing. Um, that's okay. Uh, we want to start out first by saying thank you, obviously, for the opportunity that we've had the last, it's almost four years now, representing Socorro. Um, time certainly flies. I think things have gone very, very well. Um, I will say that uh, I was kind of anxious to get out of here. I actually got a speeding ticket coming down East Lake. So if you're going home, be careful. There's a sheriff out there. <laughs> you must have something in common with Ms. Nahara. Did you really? It was probably a guy on a motorcycle, probably the same guy. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, look, I want to start out with just a couple of basic things. First, um, we recognize what the school district does and what you guys as board of trustees and board members do. And to include the administration, it's public service, um, first and foremost. We're here to make sure that children in the district and the community is well served, and we, we hope uh, in our efforts that we assist the administration and the board to reach those goals. We feel like we've done that. Uh, most of us, I think actually all of us that are here tonight, are products of public education. I think Priscilla actually went to a Socorro school. She went to a Medicus High School. Uh, so, we support public education, we support the efforts and the goals of public education, and in our service to the district, we've tried to make sure that what we do is geared towards, number one, giving you the best legal services you can receive, and then number two, making sure you get it in a cost-effective and efficient manner. Um, historically, school districts here in El Paso have had varied levels of representation. I know because we've represented some of the other school districts. Recently, we've taken over for some of the other school districts, and I like to think that part of that success has come from our success representing this school district at Socorro, the Canutillo School District, and others. Um, they've recognized that the services that we can provide can be delivered in a very timely, efficient manner. Historically, I did this presentation in 2013, the end of 2013, when we first took over. This school district has a history, and I think it's a credit to the administration, past and current, of making sure that lawyers are used appropriately. I don't think that's true in all school districts. In fact, I know for a fact it's not because some of the work we've taken over from other firms, and we've really scaled back what lawyer involvement is required and what is asked of us. If you look historically at your billings here in Socorro, you're about a third of what they are in your neighboring districts of El Paso and Isleta, districts that are of a similar size. Um, I had handed this out the last time, and I'm just going to go over it briefly. So El Paso averages about $900,000 annually in legal fees. That's come down because now they have an in-house counsel with Sezzi Collins over there. Um, Isleta averages roughly $800,000 a year in legal fees. Um, Socorro has a historical average of about $238,000. $240,000 in legal fees. Uh, since we took over in 2014, that's actually stayed the same uh, and gone down. In 2015, it dropped to $213,000. In 16, it was $185,000. This year, we're on pace to be at the same level, right between one hundred eighty and $190,000 in legal fees. And I'm not telling you to consider legal services just based on price, but I'm telling you that it is a factor that you should consider because quality legal services and we've provided those since we've been here, can be delivered cost effectively. I know Mr. Ressa looks at that. I mean, he will call me and say, hey, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? I get calls from the administration when they actually need something. They'll ask us, do we really need to have a lawyer involved in this? And we'll tell them whether we do or whether we don't. Sometimes we do, and sometimes you're going to have matters that become larger than you would normally expect. But for the most part, your administration doing their job can handle things and receive advice in a timely fashion and make good decisions. We try to do that. I think over the years, we've developed a good working relationship, and I have some folks here that I'll introduce to you uh, in various areas, purchasing with Mr. Garcia and his team, HR with Mr. Campoy and his team, facilities with Mr. Ironton and his team in the curriculum department. Curriculum, we don't really have a whole lot of heavy lifting in curriculum. Your curriculum runs very, very well here. Uh, these other areas, from time to time, we have large projects. And so we have a staff. I only bought a few of the lawyers, a couple of other lawyers or off at other meetings and events that they needed to attend. 
Um, but here tonight, I want to introduce them to you. Um, these are people that are currently engaged in some pretty heavy lifting for the district. Um, Rudy Mata and Ana Escobedo. They work in our real estate and business department. Um, we've been handling, well, they've been handling um, contracts for construction. We're right in the middle of the negotiations over the new school site. It's um, with Doug Schwartz and it's Rancho's Real number 10, I believe. Mr. Ironton is very involved in that process, and we're trying to work through that. Uh, one thing that has always been important to the board, and we talked about it last time we were hired, was relationships with developers and contractors. We don't have those types of relationships. I know that um, Mr. Schwartz and some of the lawyers that may be presenting might have those types of relationships. We try to avoid them. Our relationship is with this school district, and we don't have those types of conflicts. Um, I also have with us um, Priscilla DeMata. She works with me in our um, labor and employment section on the personnel matters. She also handles the general school law work for us. And then also um, I have Daniel Ordonez. Daniel is one of our most senior lawyers. He's Renee's brother. Renee couldn't be here. He's the Judge Alex Gonzalez's uh, campaign fundraiser. He's helping Alex with uh, his campaign, so he needed to be there. Um, Daniel and Renee handle our commercial litigation, uh, general business litigation. So if we get into an event where we're sideways with a contractor, and we end up having to file a lawsuit, we have a team that can handle that. Um, what I want to say is that our goal, obviously, is Make sure that we listen to the board's plans and needs. Make sure that we work well with your administration. Hear what the administration wants. It's not our, our goal to be here to say no. Some lawyers are there to just say, nope, you can't do that. Um, we try not to do that. There are times when we've said no. There's a legal reason why you can't do that, but our primary goal is to make sure we can get to the end goal. What does the board want to accomplish? How is the administration enacting that goal? How are we getting there? And we've done that. We've handled some large um, items for the district. We've gone through your elections. They've all been successful. Congratulations to all of you being reelected. I think that's good. Um, we're working currently on the bond and the PAC issues. We obviously handled the real estate work and we've got ongoing construction contracts and I'm constantly negotiating those with Mr. Ironton's help to make sure we get CMRs in place and different vendors in place. And then obviously we handle all the daily communications, day-to-day -day advice that the board never really cares about unless there's an issue. Um, we get calls on a regular basis. We're pretty good, I think, about making sure that we only bill for the things that require actual legal work. If I get a call on my cell phone, and it happens sometimes, I might be out at an event, I might even be playing golf. Um, I'll get a call, I can answer the question. That's what I'm supposed to be able to do. We'll answer it. We don't bill for that kind of stuff. And some lawyers will, and I think that is what causes legal bills to explode. So we try to avoid that. Uh, one of the things that was requested from us in the response was to include a listing of other districts that we represent. Um, like I said, with your all's help in representing this district and this district being so successful, moving things forward with your team approach, which we completely buy into, um, we've managed to secure additional work and we're serving currently other districts. Obviously, we're local counsel to the Ken Uteo district. You all know them well. Um, we were also hired by the Asleta district to handle personnel, litigation, and special litigation. That's a carve-out, and there's a reason for that, because their bills had been kind of going through the roof, and we had that representation. We had that representation from 2002 until about 2010. We were their lawyers. Um, they changed, and now they're coming back. Right now, all we're handling is their litigation, because that had gotten so out of control, but we're getting it in line. We also serve as general counsel to the Tornillo and San Elizario school districts. We handle everything for them. Um, again, I think that's a function of the relationships that they have, some of them with you all as board members, um, but then also knowing what we do and getting to know us in the manner in which we provide legal services. So um, we're proud of that service. Um, we've done well. Uh, we thank you all for the opportunity. I don't know if you all have questions, um, but we're happy to answer them. Mr. Blum, I have a couple of questions. Has, has your, your rate, has that changed? No, sir. In fact, uh, in our response, one of the things that Mr. Garcia's group asked for was a commitment on rates, and we've included in our response that we are committed to keeping the exact same rate structure that we have now with the board. Now, the top rate in that structure is for shareholders at 175 an hour. Um, associates are billed at 125 an hour, and legal assistants are billed at $75 an hour. That's a reduction significantly from our standard rates, which range from um, on the high end, $300 an hour to a lower end of about $150 an hour. Um, 
I actually think I negotiated those rates with you, Mr. Guetta, uh, the last time around. We talked about it. Um, and we're happy to keep those rates the same for one simple reason. I guess it's two. The district is a public service entity. Uh, we don't think that the district should be paying higher rates for those types of services. It's a public entity. And number two, uh, the district is truly a good client. It's just the way it is. Um, this school district, uh, for the work that it does generate, you never have to worry about the district paying its bills. You don't have to worry about the district um, being insolvent or having a, a difficult time getting your bills paid. Occasionally, Mr. Asa will ask me, you know, hey, how come there's two and a half hours for this? Okay, well, fine. We made a mistake on that. We'll reduce it. And we're fine with that. And I tell all of our clients, if you ever have a question about a bill, call the lawyer and ask. Mark it with a pen and say, hey, what's this for? The lawyer should be able to respond. And if there's a mistake or an error, we're not infallible. We might send you 15 or 20 pages worth of invoices. Sometimes something slips through that shouldn't be billed. We'll correct it. Um, so yes, we've agreed to keep those the same. Mr. Bunker, you, you mentioned that you've been with us four years already. And when we hired you back in 2013, you were also doing work for Canotillo. Yes, sir. And, and now you're doing work for Sanelli and Isleta as well? Sanelli, Isleta, and Tornillo. We handle some real estate work for the El Paso School District, and we've been asked to handle some litigation for them, but we've not engaged that work. They have some insurance issues that um, frankly don't fit with our structure and our rates, so we've passed on that work so far. So I guess it's just that other districts are trying to follow us, right? Basically. I think so. <laughs> I, I honestly feel that way. When we were picking up more clients, the success of this district in Ken Utio, it's one of the things that the board members will tell me. You run into people at events and you talk to them and say, hey, can you come do our work? And well, one board member really can't make that decision on their own, but obviously we're welcoming of that additional work. Um, our firm has done well. We've grown. I think uh, when we started with Socorro, I'm going to have to go back and think. One, two, three. We've added four lawyers since that time. I'm counting um, Elizabeth. Uh, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy Mata's wife, Elizabeth, also works with him. Um, she's really the brains behind the operation. So <laughs> uh, I count her in that. She's part-time, though, because she teaches at New Mexico State as well. And by working in other school districts, um, Tornillo and Isleta and San Eli and Socorro, Cajnotillo, it won't slow you down working for Socorro District at all? No, um, it hasn't. We prioritize that work. I think we've, uh, we've developed some systems. I know, for example, with the um, purchasing and the human resources departments, we've got some systems in place where we regularly contact each other by email. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Lozano and Mr. Garcia's group, um, she will at the start of the month, she'll send me a series of emails for things that we're going to review and approve, and she'll tell me. I need this by this date, um, or it's for this next board meeting, we'll review them. And we try to make sure that we get those turned around. Now, sometimes uh, things are beyond our control. I know the uh, real estate transaction that we're working on right now is a little frustrating. I know Mr. Einstein's a little frustrated by the, uh, an issue that's come up where we have to get a lien released, but it's not on our side. And we'll deal aggressively with the other side to get that finished. And the reason I mention it, because I know every time I've called you or I've emailed you, you've, you've respond right back. And you call me back, so I, I do appreciate that. I try to. I know uh, um, Dr. Espinosa is a late worker, too. Sometimes I get calls, and we always try to get right back to each other. I, I, I'm like that. That's just the way I am. I was trained that way. We try to get all of our lawyers to do that. Um, if a client needs something, you need to respond. There are some times I can't. Uh, I was on vacation with my wife this past weekend, and she made me put my cell phone away for a few hours. But otherwise, I'll try. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, pre President Kevin May. Um, Mr. Brown, you, I think you mentioned it earlier in your presentation, the cost of like our district compared to the other ones, because I, I didn't see it here. Could you re Sure. I, uh, I had handed this out, and I've got, I can email it to you. This came actually from KFOX. Um, at the end of 2014, they did a, a report. Um, over a three-year average, El Paso was spending $900,000 on um, outside legal counsel. Asleto was spending eight seventy, eight hundred seventy thousand on outside legal counsel. Socorro averaged two thirty eight on outside legal counsel. Clint was one seventy five. Canutillo was one thirty. And then the others, pretty precipitous drop off from there, below six figures. They're much smaller districts. Um, that effort by this district is board driven and administration driven. I'm not saying that we're the ones that came in and save the bacon and cut all those rates. It's the way you manage your lawyers, and we believe in that. 
the rates have stayed the same or gone down, and at the other districts that we represent, it's been the same result. It's how you deliver legal services, and I think that's an administration win and victory to make sure they stay under control. Thank you, Mr. Blanco. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the next firm that we're bringing in is uh, Mount Screen, Myers, Safi, Paxton, and Gall. Also, just to keep for your information, this is an RFQ qualification, so really price doesn't come into the evaluation part of it. It does when we do the contract. It is a consideration, but because these are qualifications, uh, I think looking at their past history, the work they've done, number of uh, lawyers is something we want to consider. So uh, Mount Screen is the, the next company that we're bringing in. Okay. okay. Welcome. Good evening. How are you all this evening? Great. Good. Uh, Mr. Board President, Trustees, Dr. Espinosa, my name is Bruce Kaler and I'm with the law firm of Mount Screen Myers. And we are one of El Paso's oldest law firms. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of items. Monica Pettis, who works closely with me, is going to also speak. And so I'm going to leave a few minutes for her towards the end. And I also want to introduce a couple of my partners as well. John Burkleback. Uh, Mr. Burkleback is uh, in the real estate and transactional practice, Clyde Pine. He's involved with commercial litigation, real estate, and, and business transactions. And then Monica Pettis. She works with me in labor and employment law, general school law issues. She handles a, a lot of Public Information Act requests. And she also handles some personal injury trial work as well. And so I'm very pleased to have them here today. You know, there's a lot we can talk about, but I, I really want to talk about two things, and then Monica is going to close out with me. Um, one of the issues I think you have to look at when you're judging um, who you employ as your counsel, the number one issue is competency. Are they competent to handle the work that you're going to give them? And I would submit that. Uh, my law firm, Mount Screen Myers, is highly competent in the area of school law. 
Now, Tony Safi, who is not with us this evening because he has a school engagement for another client, he's been practicing in the area of school law for 30 years. He has uh, been chair of the Texas Council of School Law, uh, chair of the school law section of the State Bar of Texas. He has been designated by Texas Monthly as a super lawyer in, in school law. He's also a, a top 50 lawyer in, in Central and West Texas, which encompasses uh, Austin and all points that are uh, west of, of Austin. And so um, highly competent in this area. He is known statewide as an individual who has intricate knowledge on school law issues. And this is important because he and those individuals, and I'll talk a little bit more later, that have decades of knowledge, who know the issues backwards and forwards, can provide you advice based upon that knowledge and history. They don't have to look it up because they've known it and they've known changes in the law because I can tell you that Mr. Safi has been involved through the state bar in helping craft some of the legislation. John Berkelback is uh, a super lawyer again um, in, in the area of real estate law and a lot of the, what I'm talking about are some of the awards and, and, and recognition that we received. These are from other practicing lawyers who will look and, and rate other attorneys and to get this level of recognition is difficult. And Mr. Berkelback um, is a super lawyer in real estate, Clyde Pine in business litigation, um, and 12 of our attorneys at Mount Screen Myers are designated as Texas super lawyers. That's more than any other firm in town, and there are a lot bigger firms than ours. But it shows that person for person, uh, men and women alike, we have extremely talented individuals. Um, Mark Dore and I are both super lawyers and we're both board certified in labor and employment and, and we do a tremendous amount of that. Monica Pettis has been a practicing attorney since 2012 and handles some very complex matters in the school law realm. And another indicator of our competence, you know, U.S. News and World Report along with Best Lawyers, which is one of the preeminent rating services. There are a total of five tier one education law law firms in the state of Texas. One of those is in El Paso, and that's Mount Screen Myers. And that is the type of recognition that shows a history of excellence, a history of providing clients with highly competent work. And to receive the types of ratings that we have are significant. And another issue uh, that does come up, which I do think is important, is when lawyers are called upon in those difficult situations by a client. When a client calls up, when it is something out of the ordinary. Um, and I know for one of the school districts, when there were issues with regard to allegations of impropriety with regard to federal uh, issues, a number of upper level administrators were implicated upper level campus administrators um, as well. And Monica and I handled for this district a large number of very complex issues with regard to administrators who potentially violated numerous state and federal statutes. And these were individuals who were well-educated, had attorneys, and, and fought tooth and nail. And I can say that through all of those TEA proceedings that Monica and I took part in, we were successful across the board. And when the city of Socorro had issues with regard to its police department, we were called upon to assist in termination proceedings regarding a large number of city of Socorro police officers. And we had civil service commission hearings on numerous police officers, Ms. Pettis and I did, and we were successful in every civil service commission hearing we had. Um, and I know that Clyde and Mr. Berkelback are called upon on condemnation issues uh, for governmental entities when it absolutely have to condemn property as soon as humanly possible for a project that has to go forward. And Clyde and John both handle very complex bidding issues, issues um, with regard to such things as E-rate, complex school law issues that most attorneys are not going to be familiar with. 
And Clyde often says, and it's absolutely true, the answer to a lot of questions in the private sector to, to uh, the answer to a lot of questions in the private sector will be yes. If you're dealing with a school district, the answer, answer to that same question is often no. And you have to have an attorney with that experience and knowledge to know, yes, we can do this, or no, we can't do that. The second issue I want to talk about before I turn it over to Ms. Pettis is, you know, competency is important. Ethics is also extraordinarily important, in my estimation. And our firm is known first as being competent, but also for being extremely ethical. And I want to talk just briefly about a situation. It was a school district situation. And our school district had been retained as counsel for a district. And an individual who was close to some board members came to our law firm, members of our law firm, and said, listen, I will guarantee you're going to keep that work, but you have to pay me a portion of your fee. All right? Well, that's not appropriate. That's not ethical. That's not legal. And we told him that in very blunt, direct terms. Well, two weeks later, that board ended our contract uh, for legal services. Well, that individual was later indicted, tried in federal court, and went to a federal penitentiary. But we had what I, I went to El Paso High School, we're all, except for Clyde, Clyde grew up in Midland, but we're all products of El Paso Public Schools. Um, my football coach at El Paso High School, Manny Rodriguez, liked to say that, you know, you have to have intestinal fortitude. You have to be willing to make the hard decision when there's an easy decision um, that would be wrong. And we made that decision, and frankly, I don't think it was that tough. We did the right thing, um, and, but it had real world consequences. And so you want to have attorneys that will do the ethical, right, moral, correct thing, no matter what takes place. And I can promise you that's what we as a law firm will do. And so I'd like to provide the remainder of my time to Ms. Pettis. Good evening. As you heard uh, Mr. Kaler indicate, our firm has been a full service law firm since 1904. And we've represented school districts uh, for the past 60 years, not only here in El Paso, but all over West Texas. And due to that extensive uh, experience, our clients are able to enjoy cost-effective services. Why? Because we don't have to reinvent the wheel like Bruce said, or we have seen that issue before. And another thing that really sets us apart from other law firms is our extensive community involvement. Um, our firm encourages the attorneys to get involved, give back to their community, and our attorneys probably make easily over uh, the, the leadership, at least, of over a, a dozen boards, nonprofit boards in our community, which I think is very important. And I currently serve as the president of the El Paso Young Lawyers Association and immediate past president of MABA, or the Mexican American Bar Association, where uh, we work together with the Libertas Academy uh, that the district has. So we were able to put together a free legal clinic. I spoke at their women in uh, law conference back in April. So it's been a great experience to, to see what the district um, has as their future leaders and people that will stand before the board sometime. And so our firm, as you've heard, is not only focused on providing these excellent legal services, but we also excel in our community involvement. Thank you. At this time, does any board members have any questions? <coughs> if I may, uh, what are your feeds? The fees, we do have a fee schedule that we did attach, and it's, and it's based on the years of practice that the, uh, each of the attorneys have. We have rates for our newest associates, the second tier associates, and different rates for the shareholders. Um, and that is in our proposal. Let me get to that specific. Page 10. Will we, uh, yes, page 10. And the, we have the rate for paralegals at 75, and then associates between 135 and 140. Uh, 50 and then shareholders 160 and for the more senior um, attorneys going up to 225 but all of that is negotiable and 
and we work with all of our governmental entity clients to work out arrangements that make sense from a fiscal standpoint. And just one other point, I'm Clyde Pine. One of the keys on those rates, you just don't want to look at the rates, you also want to look at how much time does it really take? Because if we know the stuff, we have the experience, it may take a five minute phone call and you get the answer. You're not sending someone back that has to do three hours of research to give you the same answer. So that's one of the things to keep in mind and one of the things we try to draw with all of our government clients and particularly school district clients. Our fees actually, if you look at the gross fees in aggregate, are generally very much are cheaper as well because we're able to get the answer a lot quicker for them. Thank you. Thank you. I see that you're also working for EPSD and Isleta. That is correct. And if we were to hire you, we were to hire you, you here, got you all here in Socorro. Would that tie you up? Because that's one of the top three major districts. No, but both of those districts have uh, in-house general councils, and we work very closely with the general councils uh, of those two districts. Sezi Collins is general counsel for EPISD. We do work with her on a frequent basis. Um, Isleta has. Um, uh, yeah, Susan Austin as their general counsel. And so the, the amount of legal work with those two entities is significant, but um, not huge. And so that would not impact at all our ability to service Socorro. President Gaylor, I've got a question. Mr. Gaylor, um, one of the things that we um, typically in our board meetings, the board president will have um, contact, our superintendent will have contact with our legal counsel. Well, we have, and, and I'm looking at the, the list of the personnel who would be assigned to SISD if we were to go with your firm. Um, would we have one point of contact, somebody who either the board president or the superintendent or cabinet members would just be able to pick up the phone and say, okay, we've got this question, um, or would it be call the office and then whoever's there? How, how would no, you, you would have one structure to me? Yes, ma'am. You would have one point of direct contact, and that would be with Tony Safi. And, and he is by far the most experienced school law attorney in West Texas, bar none. And, and I can say that he would be mad at me if he knew I was talking about him like that, but it's absolutely true. Um, and he is an absolutely tremendous resource. And that's what Mr. Pine is saying, is that his level of knowledge, and he's an incredibly bright man, um, is such that Oftentimes, he will know, he will cite statutes, multiple statutes off the top of his head, and, and he'll know exactly when they were amended and changed and why they were amended and changed and how the, the, the uh, Commissioner of Education has examined these issues. And so you get a precise answer very quickly, very economically, and as Mr. Pine indicated, you don't want to have to have, well, we're going to have an associate uh, research that, and, and we'll get back to you in a couple days. No, that's not what you want. And, and so... But there are, you know, I do a lot of human resources type work, and so it's not unusual for the associate superintendent for human resources at whichever district to just call me directly. Um, and so, but as a general rule, as far as the board president, superintendent, that would generally go to Mr. Safi, unless for some reason he's not available, but he typically is. He's extremely accessible, and, and we would make sure that you would always have a specific point of contact and, and he would be it. But if he's out of town, he lets everyone know I'm going to be out of town. I can still be reached here, but Mr. Kaler, Mr. Pine, Ms. Perez are all available. And so we take care of our clients. We've had a lot of very long-term clients and it's because we provide good advice, but we're very economical. We, we represent a lot of governmental entities because we do provide um, good, prompt, appropriate legal advice at, at an appropriate um, uh, monetary fee. And so, um, and, and that would be our uh, position and our promise to Socorro is to, that's how we handle business. That's how we will continue to handle business. And, you know, it was, and um, we are real good. And one issue we didn't touch upon, but is training issues. And one thing that I've tried to do in my practice and I speak a lot to teacher organizations, um, uh, principals, uh, um, association of uh, administrative personnel, school personnel, and we talk through a lot of these issues to avoid a lot of the problems. And I think it really has been successful. We, my clients have a lot uh, less litigation than you would expect for the size of a lot of these entities because they know when to call me, when not to. 
We, there are a lot of things that we can do. And if I have just one second, uh, an individual I know who files a lot of lawsuits, there was a situation for another district. We were able to, in an informal conference, resolve it all. And he was like, you know, we are almost always able to work this stuff out so that we don't have lawsuits and litigation. And he was, I thank you for being that way, but it helps your client out. And that's always been my attitude. If we can solve an employee problem and make that employee happy and avoid litigation, well, we've done our job. And so that's the attitude we have. We want to avoid as many problems as humanly possible. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. So the, the next firm we have now will be Scott Holtz. And again, it'll be 10 minutes Q&A and, um, and then presentation and five minutes Q&A. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Honorable Board of Trustees, um, Dr. Espinosa, my name is Rosemary Marin. I am a, um, a member of the Scott Holtz Board of Directors. I'm also chair of the Labor and Employment and Education sections. And on behalf of the firm, I want to thank you very much for inviting us to be here today. With me today is my colleague, Blake Colley, Big Downey, and Liz Guinan who is our marketing coordinator. At my firm is a list of 30 lawyers who are available to assist in whatever cap capacity the district needs. We have some packets for you to look at today. And I want to tell you um, up front that the wrong version arrived to you guys. This should be 10 pages, and you receive much more than that. If you want us to take out the rest of it, we're happy to do so. We realized it once we got here, but after you had them in your hand. And so if you want us to, to remove the extraneous information, we're happy to do that. Um, what I will do is walk you through, because regardless of how many pages of those tabs you look at, we have it divided into four tabs. The first tab is the qualification statement. And what I'll tell you about that is that our firm has extensive experience in representing large school districts. We've been very successful in trial and on appellate um, work, and as well as in administrative uh, proceedings. We do everything from personal injury to construction and contract disputes. We do litigation, labor and employment, administrative hearings. We also have 
a very deep team of transactional lawyers. You all just had that big bond pass, and I know that you need very strong transactional lawyers who can help you with procurement, who can help you with contracts, and so forth and so on. Uh, we have a very strong legal team of more than 150 years of experience, uh, combined experience in our transactional team. Those folks are available to help um, with anything that's necessary. We handled the YISD bond way back in 2003. After that, we didn't handle the bond. We handled the co contract and procurement work after that bond. And it was a lot of work, but our lawyers were able to handle it handily because we do have a deep team of lawyers who are able to jump in and, and do things. I know that at that time, it was very important to have prompt responsiveness from lawyers because the contracts are moving quickly and you need folks that are going to be responsive. I can tell you that our lawyers have our cell phone numbers on our cards. We're available to our clients 24-7. Uh, we know that business hours aren't always as convenient uh, to contact your lawyers and we're available at any time. Uh, we have handled procurement and contract issues and all kinds of other transactional things. We have also construction lawyers on our team who handle everything from negotiating contracts all the way to contractual disputes regarding construction. And so, um, as I said, we've got substantially more than 150 years of experience in our transactional team. I think our litigation team has something like 257 um, years of experience, uh, of combined experience on our litigation team. And so, we are very deep in experience. You will also see uh, at tab two, the references from various school districts, they're pretty self-explanatory. What I can tell you is that our school district clients have been very happy with us, um, and, and we have not lost any school district matter on a grievance, an administrative claim, a trial, an appellate issue. We've never lost one. Uh, and so uh, that's why I think our school district clients are very happy with our work. On tab three, you'll find the bios, and that's where most of our pages are, by the way. <laughs> we have 30 lawyers. And, and what you will see is one short, uh, the short one-page bios. Um, we have more detailed bios on our website, but in the interest of space, or what we thought was in the interest of space, we did one-page bios. What you'll find in the bios is that we have a very diverse group of lawyers. We have um, varied levels of experience and skill, and we have many different areas of law that we cover. The common threads among our lawyers is are two, two. The first is we have a high level of excellence in the lawyers that we hire at Scott Hulse. You'll see in the biographical information that we recruit only the best and the brightest. You'll see many honors in people's educational histories. You'll also see many honors in their practice history. Um, once hired, we train our lawyers meticulously to ensure that our clients receive the same level of excellent service our clients have received for more than 125 years. The second common thread that you'll find among our lawyers is a commitment to our community. At our firm, it's a requirement, it's a very strong culture that our lawyers give back to our community. And what that means is that we expect our lawyers to volunteer on, in community and faith-based and every other kind of group that's going to give back to our community. We believe very strongly in um, the, the gratitude that we should all have for having served this community for more than 125 years, we haven't done it without the commitment and the, the reciprocation from the business community, and we're very grateful for that. Part of that, and that leads me to the fourth uh, tab in your, in your binder, is our fee structure. Part of our commitment to the community is that we discount our rates substantially for our school district clients, nonprofits, and other tax-exempt organizations. And we do that because we believe that organizations like yours deserve to have the best legal services available, but you have the challenge of being able sometimes to pay the rates that private entity clients can pay. And as a result of that, we've made a decision as a firm a long time ago that our public entity clients would receive substantially lower rates. Um, and so we know that there are other firms in the state that charge a lot more. And we know, too, that there may be some firms in, in town that charge less. Uh, what I will tell you is that we think it's necessary for you to have great lawyers. You are a very thriving district. You're a district that is doing wonderful things in this community that has made tremendous strides and is growing at such fast pace. 
that you need the best there is. And we believe firmly that we are who, those lawyers. But we also think that we should, you should hire whoever it is at reasonable rates. And we think that we've given you those reasonable rates, for especially because we know how discounted they are. What I'm going to ask you is not to let the rates be an obstacle, however. If you find that somebody else charges less than we do, and you think that, that we should charge you less and that's a fair amount, then we'll talk to you about it. Don't let our rates be an obstacle. I say that to every client that, that I engage. I've had a lot of the same clients since the beginning of my, my tenure as a lawyer 25 years ago. And the reason for that, I think, and, and, and the reason that my firm has been around for so long, is we share the common value of honest, ethical, excellent legal service. We do that from everything from the beginning, the first encounter with our clients, all the way through the end when the, when the case is, is dismissed or the case is concluded, and all the way in between in our billing. We have very high ethical standards with regard to our billing services. We have a professional responsibility committee that meets every Monday, and that committee um, it, it looks at any kind of conflicts of interest, any ethical issues that may be uh, that may be confronting the firm because of some representation, and they also help us set our rates. And as a result of that, we know we're we're very cognizant of what the rates are that are out there. We're very cognizant of the kinds of the kinds of things that you can pay, the kind of rates that you can pay from out of town, and we know that you can get our work cheaper, but you're not going to get it better. And I believe that sometimes when people charge really, really low rates, they can get you on the other side by inefficiency or assigning too many, case, too many people to a file. We don't do that. We have a team of lawyers that's assigned to a matter, typically a senior lawyer and a less experienced lawyer who's going to do the research and that kind of stuff at lower rates. But we always have supervision of the work, and we do it in the way that is the most efficient for our clients. By doing so, we're able to save you money in the long run and you're also able to ensure that you al always have a senior lawyer uh, overseeing your work and involved in your work. If we are able to get this contract, I will personally be responsible for this uh, account, and I will be personally available if, 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 with regard to anything that happens, whether it's transactional or litigation. It's really important for the lawyers to collaborate to ensure that we're not duplicating services, but also to ensure that we're covering you in the, in the best way possible. And so you'll have me uh, at your disposal 24-7 if we are able to obtain this contract. I'll give you a little bit of time back if you all have any questions. At this time, do any board members have any questions? The question that, that, that I would have, one of the, one of the questions that, that um, I was going to ask Ms. Marin is, um, you know, being a larger firm and, and looking at some of the, the other districts and the other entities that you all <coughs> represent, um, you know, who would be our point of contact? Would we have a point of contact? Or, but you answered that question. So Good. Yes, ma'am. You must have been reading the <laughs> Well, you know what it is, is that I know that with a large entity, the left hand needs to know what the right hand is doing. And having represented very large entities, I know that it's important for one person to be the point of contact who knows everything that's going on so that when advice is given, the, this person knows. And, and if there's a contradiction, in, in one thing or another, this person knows. Great. Any other questions? No, sir. Thank you, Ms. Marie. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. the Thank opportunity. You. Good luck in your decision. <laughs> So President Guetta, members of the board, those are the three uh, firms that are here for your presentation to, to present to you, their mm -hmm. services. Um, feel free to have any kind of questions, I mean, uh, certain comments that you want to make with respect to any of the firms, or you can go ahead and make a recommendation for uh, this particular RFQ. 
Mr. Yeah, Mr. Gern, um, I, uh, I think that Mr. Blanco represented us well through all these years, uh, so that I recommend he would be second. Kept. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Gonzalez, second by Ms. Nahra. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. We'll Aye. go ahead and, and uh, notify him tomorrow, and then we'll work on the contract. Right. I, I would like to make a comment. Um, you know, these, these were excellent firms, and um, I think the support that we would receive from any of these firms would be outstanding. Um, I agree with Mr. Gonzalez. Um, uh, Mr. Blanco has represented us well these past few years. Um, obviously, in looking at our counterparts, you know, not not looking at, at fees or anything like that, fee structures, but um, again, I agree with Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Blanco has done a, a very good job in representing um, our, our best interest, the best interest of, of the district. But I think we had some, and, and thank you to the committee that, that kind of looked at, at the, the finalists that were going to present to us. Um, I appreciate the work that you all did. Um, the, these were outstanding candidates. They, they were outstanding law firms. Thank you. Uh, I, I totally agree with that statement. You know, had, had it been, I think had it been, we had not been represented by any of them in the past, this would have been a very, I mean, a very difficult decision. Mm -hmm. True. Very true. Yeah. Because they, they were all very well qualified. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. President, get it from me. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Rodriguez. I mean, three top law firms uh, that we heard. But um, Mr. Blanco, he, he did mention you know, some of the, the comparisons between neighboring school districts and, and us. So I would like to thank, you know, our our amazing cabinet and team. Yes. Our, you know, to helping in keeping those costs down through professional development and training of our principals, assistant principals, obviously cabinet members, to stop them at an early point in a certain specific case, handle it and handle it handle it efficiently and also effectively. So that has continued to keep our, our, our costs down. So uh, great job to all our amazing employees here in SISD. Thank you, sir. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this different from this one? No, I mean, it's no sense in waiting. I mean, we're not making a decision. Yeah. There's no call for it. Right. We're going to take a five-minute recess. That's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Time is 6.39. 47. We'll, we'll move on to number four, board workshop. Discussion and review of facilities advisory committee findings and recommendations. Mr. Ayington. Good evening, President Guerra, Dr. Espinosa, members of the board. Last night, you should have, uh, after our Monday workshop, uh, last night you should have received an uh, electronic file of the information that we provided you in the booklet. Uh, it might have changed a little bit, but it's basically the same information that was uh, sent to you electronically. We've got the original, the uh, 
recommendation from the fact committee the six hundred and fifteen million five oh seven six fifty as the first part and I have all of this book on slides if you want to go through each slide uh, but what let me just go to you got the table of contents and then you got the overview that lists all of the projects and then going to page four it's Socorro High School and it basically tells you what that estimated cost is and a brief uh, description or a synopsis of what that project is but let's let's go to another one that has a little bit more backup let's go to um, page go to the high school improvements page um, nine which is basically the high school improvements uh, which is the 146 million uh, a little over 146 million and then it has Montwood High School on page nine at an estimated cost of 56 million 588 to 50 and then the, the pages right behind that are the actual pages from the uh, assessment report the green page being in the educational appropriateness and it basically tells you how it was compared to uh, uh, Pebble Hills High School and then the blue pages is the facility assessment where the four different categories were broke broken down and then it gives you a little bit more detail on each of the categories. We can go through all 80 plus slides if you want to, or I can answer questions. I just have questions. I don't need us to go through everything, but I do have a few questions. May I? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Rankin. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the support um, for the technology. Yes, ma'am. Talking about building a building for technology. Um, so the technology part that is down at Tantum and the offices that are here in the DSC, would they all be moved into the new building? Is that? Yes, it would be it would be combined. Uh, okay. That area would be combined. They take up some of the second floor, uh, mm -hmm. basically over the entrance right now in the wing down here, right. along with some of the curriculum. We would, you know, that would get into the actual detail of the built-in. Uh, it's not going to be a, I envision an addition to this building, preferably out front. Okay. And, you know, then they would move into portions of that, or they, they could even stay in an uh, in a area here, but it's going to be adjacent to them. The people in the, in, in, at Tantum would be able to move up here and have space up in this building along with the network operation <coughs> center, the NOC. Okay, and, and so if they were in the new building, then that would free up, I mean, could like where technology is now, could those be renovated for additional meeting rooms or? Oh, most definitely, because the concept of, on this building when we did it 10 years ago was, you know, that's why we have the partitions right. and, you know, you have wide open areas that area up there could be easily divided into two, three different smaller meeting rooms. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and really the purpose is just to get Mr. Raina out of the DSC. Yes, we want, him, we want him as, we'd prefer him to go down to Tantum, but he wants to come up here. Okay, uh, Mr. Huntington, uh, according to the facilities assessment, there was an extensive list of things that needed to be fixed at maintenance and operations at Tantum. And, but you mentioned to us if a warehouse became available that maintenance and operations could move into a warehouse. Was that I correct? That was, that's, that's a thought. And, and that's, uh, we put the, the monies in here for that. Uh, that building was built in 1960, I believe I said that. Uh, we occupied it in 1994. That was a question on Monday. We actually moved in it uh, around 1994. Uh, you know, in talking to a couple of my staff members that were been here long enough, they felt like it was 
they didn't know if it was 92 or 94, but somewhere in, 19, in the uh, early or mid 1900s, uh, 1990s, uh, not 1900s, 1990s, uh, <laughs> they moved into, we've been housed in that facility. Okay, um, okay. My point is, you know, if we were able to get a warehouse, would we still need to do the all the repairs that are down in Tantum? Will there be anybody still left at Tantum is, is my point. Because I know Child Nutrition Services is down there. Print Shop is down there. Child well, Nutrition is actually at the Ed Center. They're not down there anymore. Okay. Uh, but that, that, would, that would be something. Technology would be vacating. Right. Uh, of course, we would have to watch out for the waterfalls and stuff and the leaks in the building, but they would be vacating some areas. Uh, we would just have to analyze that. Uh, the, as, I, as I stated Monday, the more people we could get up here uh, in a more centralized location, as far as the maintenance of the district goes, uh, I believe I had one person tell me uh, that it's, it is a 45 minutes to an hour drive with no traffic from Tanton to Purple Heart. You know, so there is some window, windshield time that we're losing that we could, if we were centered here, it would cut that in half or even less than that, that we could be, uh, you know, uh, working on productive things at the campuses and stuff. So a, if a warehouse came available, we would definitely make that uh, study and then bring it to the board and then we would determine you know what departments are all if if we need to keep something down there what would stay down there okay um, and mr. Arrington can you just tell me uh, from the facilities assessment uh, it says accessibility upgrades what does that include that that accessibility upgrade is basically uh, how you get into the building, the accessibility. You know, uh, some of them are minimal charges. Some of them have to do with uh, maybe a, a, a door mechanism is not working properly. Uh, when I used to do these assessments uh, in my prior life, you know, we documented everything, and, and you'll see that throughout. But when it says accessibility, it has to do with more access to the building how you can enter it. Uh, we get a lot of requests. Last year we got a lot of requests because of our special needs the population. Uh, individuals in wheelchairs and stuff cannot pull open the door. We've had that request here at the DSC to make that electronic door out front. We have done that in some of our campuses. So it, it has to do with, okay. with, with that. Okay, just a couple more. <laughs> okay. Looking at El Dorado, uh, I know when we were there in the past in their auditorium, they had a lot of problems you could see through the tiles, and I didn't notice that on the list of things to be fixed. And I didn't know if it had already been addressed or if it's something we could look into fixing. I think I lumped that under the exterior improvements on, and I said roofing upgrades. So, okay. uh, yes, we would address that. Okay, perfect. Um, and on the middle school, uh, there were, I believe, at least two that were needing building additions to the library according to TEA guidelines. And, and, I mean, I know whether the board looks at the 615, those would be included, but if we look at the 448, they won't be. And so are we going to be in non-compliance or the suggestions? Uh, I don't think we would be in non-compliance. I, I think that was discussed at our last facility advisory committee. Uh, and I, I kind of mentioned it and I've been mentioning it uh, because of the uh, technology age that we're in. We get a lot of our, our books and, and things electronically on tablets and, and you know, everything else. Uh, unfortunately, the TEA, the Texas Education Agency, still has the old 
standard as far as what library design are, are to be designed by. So that's what they were basing it on. Uh, I would think, I don't, uh, I can't read on an iPhone or an iPad. I still get paperback books and I still have my novels, my Pattersons and everything else. Uh, I don't, you know, books are not going to go away, but I think their, their usage is going to be reduced some. Uh, but unfortunately, TEA has not recognized that, but we're, we're kind of putting that in front of them. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and, and Mr. Arrington, as we spoke earlier about it, I do want us to look in the future. What I'm speaking about is the facilities assessment, uh, Category 3, our maintenance and operations on these campuses. It is a significant amount, and I, I think... As a district, we also need to look at providing more for our campuses and our maintenance and operations so that these can be taken care of on a yearly basis instead of needing a bond to fix them. Yes, ma'am. And, and that's what we discuss. And, and most definitely, uh, our department does their, their best through the work order systems, and, and I think I mentioned that we're implementing a new one uh, beginning this year or this past July 1st. And, you know, uh, a work order to, to paint a curb or, or repair a pothole, you know, that, that shouldn't be something that we pay for for the next 25 years. We should be able to do that within our own M&O budget and stuff. However, uh, it, you know, we are having to deal with 47 campuses, 48 to be uh, coming next year, and then five or six other buildings, you know, with that budget. And we have had a little bit of an increase uh, this year in our uh, budget, uh, but any more would help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Arrington. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kettle. Yeah, Mr. Arrington, and I just want to touch one point, and then as we get the rest, I'll, I'll talk about the rest. But uh, Ms. Na uh, Mrs. Snyder talked a little bit about the uh, warehouse and the technology and all that, and we need to move that centrally so it would be uh, better for everybody. Now, if we get to a point that we can move the whole thing, Somewhere in here, you you foresee anything that has to be there, or can we look into the the land and the facility and whatever and try and and sell it and and or you know find some other purpose? Yeah, I've, I mean I've got some thoughts. You know, uh, there you could uh, you could basically leave uh, the warehouse itself there. You know, which is taking up most of that building, uh, you know, and move all the other departments up here. But, uh, you know, but uh, that's this, you know, once we look at a facility and once a facility comes available, uh, you know, we're talking 140 something thousand square feet down there that we would have to uh, replace with, you know, probably this, this age and, can, and to upkeep, to keep up with our facilities of which we have grown since we moved in that is probably approaching 200,000 square feet or more for a, a new location. So uh, is, is any of that available around here? I'm not aware of yet, you know. So once we determine if there is a facility available, then we would actually start looking at. And yes, if we can move everything up here, uh, we don't want, you know, we, we could, uh, board's decision is to sell that properly or, or, you know, whatever they want to do with that piece of property, but that would be an option. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Arrington, as, as we're looking at the 615 and then going to the 448. Yeah, the second part of the presentation is uh, probably on page 50, 56. 56 starts the uh, the 448 presentation that was uh, briefly shown 
on Monday night. So there, there's actually two, two presentations. And I've included some of the same inserts that were a part of the 615 as far as the, the backup document. Uh, you know, so that is the second part. And I also have a little timeline schedule in there that is a fold-out sheet. Just, it, I should have put draft on there because <laughs> Uh, just to show you, you know, a possibility of a timeline or schedule. But yes, that is in your book starting on page 56, I believe. And the reason I bring that up is because I noticed that we're going to, we're looking at taking out the $16 million for the middle school, but I know it's not going to mention the TA regulations for the library. My other concern would be how about the science classrooms for some middle schools? I know some of them are listed here, so are they... I mean, I'm sure they're, are, are these going to be new additions or are these just, are they up to par or? Well, we let me let uh, Ms. Farmer uh, address that. I can basically say our, our, our middle schools are in, in fairly good shape, you know, okay. as far as uh, because of the four remodels that we did through the savings on, on our four oldest one. Uh, these two schools were analyzed, and uh, they were being compared to one of our newer schools, so that's what the comparison is. And that's exactly. Hi, good evening. That is exactly what it is. A lot of the middle school work has been done, I guess, from the previous bond work, and we've been able to renovate the science labs and things such as that, so it would just... That, that is exactly why. Okay. Everything is up to date and the, the kids, the facilities are, are good. May I ask a yes, follow-up? Uh, Ms. Farmer, sorry, yes. before you leave. No. I noticed, uh, you know, there were some science labs and stuff at some of the middle schools, but there were additional classrooms at Enzer Middle School. Yes. I mean, I know they have uh, portables. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I don't know how their enrollment is looking, Ms. Macias, that if it's stabilizing or if those new classrooms are detrimental, you know, or do we must have them? Well, the enrollment is, is pretty much stabilizing. It's about where it is. It's been that way for about the past three years. Well, it continues to increase, but it's staying. So as she continues to work with the boundaries, they continually stay at around 1,070. Uh, around that area so I'll let you uh, the reason that they have been staying is because what we did is three years ago you all approved a boundary adjustment and therefore 125 little ones cohort is going to desert wind this year is the last 125 cohort going every single year ends are grew 126 so therefore the students leaving they gained plus one so therefore they're growing about 9 to 11 percent depending on the year Therefore, um, middle school number 10, we need it now. Once we open up middle school number 10, Enzer will be perfectly fine, and then some of those campuses or some of those um, classrooms, possibility of consolidating if needed. But with that new middle school, it will be good um, um, 2038 based on the calculations. We're going to be good for about 15 years. Okay, so. It's middle school 30 that will uh, allow that adjustment, and then with and that, so depending. New classrooms wouldn't necessarily be needed at Enzer, correct? No, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would you all like Mr. Ironton just to jump into the 448 or continue with what we had with the 615? To break I, down. I would. I, I hate to cut anything, but. <clears throat> 615, in my opinion, is extreme, and and so I, I would rather go right now with 448. I mean, we w we went over it briefly Monday night. Uh, unless something's changed to it, I don't need to go over it step by step. But if if the rest of the board wants to, Mr. Gonzalez, I I would like to consider the 448, but. Um, I would also want to, uh, uh, there was a comment made a little bit earlier that we do not need to go through a bond 
to get fixes and stuff like that for our school that we should be able to manage all that maintenance and growth through the uh, MMO monies that, that we get. So when, when we look at, at uh, <clears throat> the needs that are coming in the near future, I, I think we should look first of all to satisfy that we have the monies to upkeep all the facilities before we go into areas that we have no business to be in. Which areas, Mr. And I, I, it's not on the... Go ahead and mention it. Maybe, <coughs> they can, maybe Mr. Ressa can, or Mr. Ayrton can. So, Mr. And so it, it, it has to do with the uh, clinic. It's nice to have a clinic, but those monies can be used to maintain and upkeep the facilities that we're going to create. Instead of going in, in it, it's a nice thought and you know it feels good, but I think that we first need to look at the uh, educational part of the school. The concern, Mr. Gonzalez, is if the board were to approve the dollar amount and we move forward with this dollar amount and then next month, they bring it to us and we decide to talk about the building in Mountwood High School and we're thinking why we're raising taxes here possibly and then trying to do a uh, on off-site uh, medical facilities uh, how would that how would that look to the public well first I'd like to just say that when we're talking about bond I mean, that that has to do with the interest in sinking fund that's that part of the total budget and so you're looking at interest in sinking fund being I'm used sorry, to fund. Mr. Mr. Gonzalez, is that accurate? Uh, 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 partly. The, the thing is that uh, the, the problem I have is that when you take monies to build the clinic, which is nice, and prioritize it for that purpose, when other areas in uh, the development of uh, the facilities or uh, uh, training or whatever it is are being uh, left behind because we think this is something that has more priority and is something that we have no business in. We are in the business of education. And so when, when we, uh, when we are, are going to approve all this money for that and then coming later and use monies that could be used in another part, why isn't that a priority there? So, so Mr. Gonzalez, let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, this board has taken a proactive approach and they've designated or committed about $19 million of fund balance towards infrastructure projects. So in a sense, we have, and you all have taken that proactive approach to designate some fund balance out of the million operation side to be able to do things with respect to the, the, air, the, air, the, air, the HVAC upgrade with respect to schools, uh, certainly at Mountwood Middle, with respect to the aquatic center, with respect to adding lighting at the soccer fields and the football fields at the schools. So this district has done what I would suggest, what I would say is a proactive approach to make sure that we're allocating funds out of the operating budget for some of these infrastructure needs, whether they be for a replacement of boilers, whether it be replacement of resurfacing tracks, infrastructure. So we have done some of that. Um, so. But you can't do it all. I mean, it's just that this, the VLK went ahead and identified millions of dollars of, of needs with respect to remodeling, resurfacing, and so forth, number one. Number two, while we're in the business of educating kids, we are also a people business in the sense that 85% of our budget has to do with payroll and benefits because our teachers are educating our students. And part of that is a benefit that we provide to them having to do with health care. And so while we're not in the business of having a clinic. That is an ancillary uh, service that we're providing as a benefit to our employees because healthcare is vitally important to them. And it's part of our compensation package. So while, yes sir, I mean we could certainly dedicate some of those funds towards infrastructure needs with, uh, with respect to maintenance, I submit to you that we've already done that. We can continue to do that, but at a certain point, uh, our fund balance is gonna start to go down, number one. Number two, 
um, it's part of who we are. It's part of our compensation package with respect to assisting our, our employees because health care is vitally important. Um, uh, and I'm not going to discuss uh, or, or get too much into this, but we offer a very good insurance policy for all of our employees. And we try to be the best, and I think we are the best, okay? And although it should be nice to have a clinic, for instance, when they come out uh, with new technologies for uh, biology, science, and education that Mr. Reina could bring new telescopes or, or, or microscopes or whatever to implement that, those monies should be used for that purpose. I mean, it's nice that we want to do that, but we already offer that insurance to take care of that. Yes, sir. And, and, I, and I want to just submit to you is that certainly this board and the administration has worked to make sure that our health care plan is not only uh, the best but also sustainable. And because of that, we're working towards changing our, our benefit plan to make it a little bit more cost efficient for the district, but at the same time being able to ensure that it doesn't severely impact our employees with respect to their pocketbook, number one. I also want to say that with respect to the clinic, it is going to cost the district, but we're looking at maybe one to two million dollars. We're looking at a bond that's about $448 million. And so if we were to shift some of those funds, I'm not exactly convinced that it would be a significant impact to what are the needs with respect to the bond program that this district needs with respect to new schools, rebuilding Socorro High School, whether it pertains to also uh, uh, other other uh, projects that are listed there. But I, I, I do hear your, your concerns, um, and we certainly uh, keep those in mind as we move forward um, when we talk about the clinic. Do you have any questions? No. no. Okay. And Mr. Guerra, if I could just say, uh, Mr. Eyington, thank you for sending that information to us. Um, I know I had a lot of questions the other night, um, and I think the, the information you provided just helped it make more sense in my brain as to what we were looking at. And, and again, I, I appreciate that. I know it was, it was a lot of work and, and last minute stuff, but it really did clear a lot of, a lot of those questions that I had the other night. Um, it made so much more sense because now I was able to see Okay, going from this information here, really being able to look at the breakdown of, of what was needed and, and um, the, the bulleted points were great, but again, it, the, the information you provided just helped it make a lot more sense to me and looking at, okay, why so much and what are we looking at, you know, with, in each of the categories, what that meant and what we were looking at. So, Thank you. I, I know it. It took a. It was a lot of work, but no. I, I do appreciate that. Thank you and very like much. Like I said, it, it okay. really did. Just, I was able to yeah. see it. And by better. all means, between now and, and Tuesday or, or whenever, uh, please feel free to give me a call if you have any additional questions and stuff. Does anyone have any more questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> said no. I want to make sure that everybody understands. So if we have the dollar amounts that we're looking at, everybody's comfortable with, with the construction, the support services, what administration is recommending, that we're okay with it and we have any discussion, we could have another board workshop, possibly on Monday. Mr. Guerra, again, if I may, um, and I know I was, I was one of the ones that was asking a lot of questions on Monday, but again, the information we've been provided, I think helped answer a lot of, a lot of those questions that I had. So um, for me, my, for, for me, I don't think we need another, another workshop um, 
I, I think I'm good with the information that was presented. That's that's just me. And I, I as well. Mr. Arrington did a fantastic job of providing us the information, the breakdowns, expl explanations, and he answered all my questions. Yeah. Great. Mr. Arrington, thank you so much. And there's no further business with this board. The means adjourned at 718. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.